one panel what exists currently in southern africa is a system built on the plunder of black lives this is predominantly because of the colonialist regime that create like white um, South, southern africans against black africans and this not only led to social stratification but we realized that there was a stratification in terms of the politics stratification in terms of economic systems etc what we do house is a radical stance that strips these individuals up of like off of their unfairly acquired like possession continually allows them to perpetrate that continually allows them to perpetrate these particular harms what does this particularly mean notice that the apartheid regime that existed was one that was created to cement the control of white domination this particular racial separation meant that only white people were allowed to access economic spaces and also access higher heights in economic spaces. This particularly means that these white companies had monopoly over the system and these particular systems, like these particular um, like um, amounts of money was continually passed down through the white clan of these particular regimes, actively stri um, like stripping black people within Southern Africa of rights to these particular things. The worst of this is the fact that these particular systems were entrenched in the laws that is passing laws that particularly means that white people could not revolt against the system. Panel notice that it is not enough for opposition in this debate to say that reforms have existed and that we have tried to like, like close this clock like at the point where they believe a harm exists. Why is this important? Because we think that even though they have existed revolutionaries like um, Mandela, Oliver Tambo, etc., who created the Black Consciousness Movement, right? Even though we had cases of the um, Truth and Recon Truth and Reconciliation Council, etc., that seek to like seek account, like seek accountability and redress this particular system. Notice that one, the benefits that have gotten were hugely tokenistic. Two, these benefits were not impacted on a large scale. Three, because of other principles, like other international competition, competing principles, such as like immunity of these head of states, immunity of like military corporations, etc., we were not able to see a large scale reformation. We think that even if laws exist, for example, the land reform laws, for example, um, the Black Economic Empowerment Acts that exist in countries like um, South Africa, et cetera. These particular tokenistic mechanisms are one that we, uh, ones that we do not want to pander to. Why is this particularly important? Because statistics shows that the racial inequality in these particular states Has the speaker cut off for anyone else? Yes. Yeah, she just got off from me as well. Still on the high. Notice that the owner. Uh, speaker, could you pause for a moment? Speaker, are you with us? Hello. Hello. Yes, we can hear you now. Uh, I have also paused the time. Um, could speaker, are you still with us right now? Yes. Can you hear me? Uh, yes. Um, I believe that for me, the last thing I heard from you was um, about how reform, revolution, and so on uh, are insufficient for a number of reasons that you have provided. Um, are you okay to continue the speech from there? We will restart your timing whenever you're ready. Yes, I'm ready if you can hear me. Yep, all right. Uh, if you could go whenever you're ready. Okay. Three, two, one. Notice that land ownership still reflects racial disparity. For example, in Zimbabwe, we have incidents of drought and famine because of these political like instability, etc. But we think worse off is a post-pandemic world where individuals do not have the capital to emancipate themselves. We think that all these harms effectively like there. Notice that firstly, this is the speaker now cutting off anyone else as well? Continually exists because of their lack of political. Oh, speaker. Oh, Are you hello. Listening? Let me reconnect. Let me reconnect. All right, you will have two minutes to reconnect.
Hello, am I audible? Yes, you are audible now. Um, we note that in accordance with the policy, this would be, I think, the uh, second disconnection or the second tech problem. If the third problem occurs, uh, I just remind you that um, we move on to step two. So your partner will step in if you disconnect for a third time, just so you're aware. Is that all right? Yes, that's fine. Right. Uh, whenever you're ready. Um, Matt, if you are timing, could you provide the current timing for the speaker? Matt, are you uh, with us? Uh, yeah, sorry. I had paused it at 4.06 and not resumed. My apologies. Yeah, I have it around, I would say, five minutes, and I'm happy to start there, if that's okay with everyone. Okay. All right. Um, whenever you're ready, speak up. All right. Thank you. So I'll be continuing. Three, two, one. This particularly means that in the post-pandemic world, they are left into more shackles and more harms. What does the system mean? It means that apart from the fact that we are giving them reparation, which is commensurate, we think any other alternative that will be like by the opposition in this debate is one that does not commence, like it does not commensurate to the harms that is got. I'll take a POI from closing. Uh, so just to clarify, you is it the case that you will be compensating these business owners that you're taking the land and companies from or not? No, we are not going to do that. Firstly, I've already described how they were unfairly acquired. And secondly, it is their property. So at the point where we are giving it back to the true owners, we don't necessarily think that, that um, there's a need to compensate them for anything. Why is this particularly important? One, because we think that it makes their lives marginally better. Because one, it gives them money. This means that they have resources to acquire like a, a, like a huge level of economic capital that ensures like emancipation to meet up with the existing trends that black and white people have already like shackled them to access to political spaces because their lack of economic capital is the reason why they are continually see, seen as inferior citizens within these particular states and that's why they don't have access to opportunities other when now political power to do so they can run their own affairs and ensure that Policies that are in, like enacted by the government is not one that particularly like oppresses them, one, but secondly, it gives them the ability to actualize. But lastly, we think that this particularly means that um, the, like the money that they're going to acquire is one that is going to create a generational wealth that does not exist or that was robbed from them. The importance of this argument is that one, it means that they do not necessarily have to continually ponder to white narratives that are like that continually shackle them because they are very tokenistic or because they are individuals who are who have privilege do not want to let go of this privilege. But secondly, it means that they can actually get like like spearhead their own course of emancipation and at the rate they want to achieve that. We think that that particularly is right. Notice panel that over what we need to provide is a commensurate system of reparation like emancipate these people. The to date, colonialist sentiment still exists through new like imperialism, etc. It's because all forms of like reparation that have been given, all forms of compensation, never is like um, commensurate to the harm that has been done, and that is why in, like you continually shut go such individuals to puppeteering. We think that in instances where we remove the leverage that these particular pieces, like people have over their black community within I Southern Africa, we we are able to emancipate them. We are proud to propose. All right, perfect. I thank the previous speaker for the verifying speech and would like to invite the leader of the opposition to continue the case for opposition. Here. Um, three, two. One, uh, we think we still have a lot of questions about how this motion actually plays out in the world mechanistic wise. We're gonna assume what we think is a reasonable case for governance here, which is some sort of partial state control or local tycoon or oligarch control, something shared like that. We think that's the most reasonable way to look at this debate. Given that, we think that this is a really bad way to achieve the goals that OG states here, which we generally agree with. We think that uh, there the are cases of legitimacy uh, that comes from colonialism and the lack of access to rights and opportunities 
are fine, we agree with that, we think that's dependent to a huge degree on the continued economic success of these regions. And uh, we agree that you need to re uh, recompense these sort of past wrongs, but that's a wrong way. Legitimacy here depends on economic success, which enables the furtherance of access to rights and etc. Therefore, two points in my speech. Firstly, why local economies in these countries depends heavily of foreign investments that is likely to run away. And secondly, why even these specific companies that will be uh, uh, taken away are likely to collapse as well. Before that, one further point of rebuttal about, about further regulations or other sort of uh, mechanisms uh, that uh, OG claim are not possible because monopoly power and uh, that sort of thing. We think that that claim was true maybe at the point of apartheid of outright uh, control of ethnic uh, uh, of one ethnic group uh, upon another in this region that is simply less true at nowadays where there are stronger uh, governments in these countries that are able to enact antitrust laws, do away with this monopoly power and create other way more sensible regulations that have way less of a political uh, 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 power required to do them because they have more of an agreement from the people, from the companies, from the stronger actors in these economies. Or are these uh, other alternatives? more progressive taxation that is harder on the richer in their societies to decrease these inequalities, more antitrust laws to reduce the power of the stronger companies, more professional training, like forced local companies, uh, forced international companies, sorry, uh, to train more uh, more of the local po population to hire a certain percent of the local population, have st like governmental UBI, anything that will, uh, uh, we're generally pro less in inequality, we think there are way more reasonable ways to achieve that. Let's move on to my points. First point about the economies of these countries. Why do we think these countries are significantly dependent on the foreign investment? Firstly, because they don't have a strong comparative advantage that has had the benefit of developing over the decades and decades where uh, the Western world and the global north had the chance to strengthen their economies post-World War II, uh, these countries that weren't co uh, colonized. These are also countries that are heavily dependent on natural resources that is very hard to extract and they're uh, like diamonds and cobalt and, and oil and therefore require the help of mo large multinational corporations. We think their economies are also heavily dependent on ex uh, export, like uh, agricultural products, and in addition to these natural resources, and that is heavily dependent on the ability to have a strong connection with other companies around the world and their uh, willingness to enter the local market, and also your ability to import large uh, uh, amounts of uh, uh, commercial products and that sort of thing to balance with the local uh, currency. All of that means that these countries are really, really dependent on having strong connections with the globalized economy. Now, why you're really likely to have uh, foreign investments running away? The, now there is a really, really reasonable fear th that you'll have 0% uh, uh, money back on your initial investment. We think that given a government that does this sort of thing, that takes away control of companies from the investors, from the uh, uh, multinational corporations that invested from uh, uh, specific ethnic people in these companies. We think that uh, foreign investment will be reasonable in assuming this is likely to happen again in some sort of form and I'm likely to lose out on my investment. Also, given that they already did this, this investment, now they have much less control on decision-making within their own companies, which is something that we think is very important for them. Firstly, because they trust themselves more. People tend to trust their own decision-making better than people that they had no say in hiring into their companies. And also they are likely to think of these uh, new deciders within these companies as having less expertise and therefore be less trustworthy. Also, they have way less guarantees on regulations and, 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 and judicial systems within these countries that now are sort of like in a new and chaotic state, which is a, crucial for a healthy business environment. What happens then to the economy like bottom line? You simply have less money flowing in, which means you can open less new factories, less new businesses, create fewer jobs for the people in these countries, have less an opportunity to give them new opportunities, new economic opportunities. These people have now less food for food and drugs and, and, and medication, now, all that sort of thing that they need. On the comparative, these companies have an interest to hire 
uh, like from whatever uh, ethnic group that they have. They need people that speak the local language. They need to have a connection with local governments. They need to have people who understand the market better. They need to have the ability to recruit more workers. That means that money does flow to local hands and both through that and through better taxation. Uh, before I continue, let's take CG. Um, to clarify, uh, why are individuals who stay within the country uh, less capable of enforcing accountability? This is not not even close to what I said. This is not even close to my claim. I think we uh, these are people uh, like the considerations of foreign investment. None of what I've said so far hinges that. I think what they're likely to see is the governments of these countries made this horrible, bizarre choice. I am very likely now to lose money on my investment. Therefore, I want to run away. None of that relates on the uh, uh, capabilities of local people. Uh, let's talk about these specific companies because we do think that while they don't lose like potentially uh, 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 rel uh, like rebel, uh, reliable employees, they are very likely to lose the people who are experienced in running these companies in the first place and have all the best practices. We think that it's likely that the C-suit will leave because first of all, they are probably compensated with some sort of share in the company itself that has now gone away. They are likely to receive less compensation, even if that's not true. They lose the personal connection to the owners, to the founders, to the international branches of the companies that they used to have. We think all of these are important for you to be able to run the company efficiently, and therefore you're likely now to leave. This is important because losing the people, and that's also true of these CEOs or of the local population in the first place. That's crucial because these are people who are really good at guaranteeing the success of these companies that navigate them in international markets and that therefore that is terrible. For all these reasons, very proud to oppose. I thank the leader of the opposition for the verifying speech and by the deputy prime minister to continue the case for government. Yeah, yeah. Hello, I'm audible. Yes, I can hear you. I believe you're currently muted. DPM, I believe you're currently uh, muted. If you could unmute yourself, please. Yeah, you are muted. Um, I will also note that you are a little bit soft. Is there any way for you to increase the? Uh, is this is this audible enough? Yes, this is much better. Thank you. Okay, sure. Um, so I'm beginning in three, two, one. Panel, we think that we are having this debate because of the um, argument we get from OU. Because what O argues is the very reason why we are arguing this debate. Like, and this looks like it. O says that these businesses are well established. They already have these particular connections with the outside world. And that's how these businesses are booming in the very first place. In an event where there is a change of ownership, you are more likely to lose these particular outcomes or these particular links and chains that they have with the global world. But secondly, he says that, well, these blacks whom we are going to have as ownership cannot necessarily run these particular companies well. We think that all of these things were part of the structures that were used to exploit these blacks and prevent them from things that they legitimately owed, right? It looked like, oh, well, because you cannot do it, well, let me do it for you. And, th and that is how come we've come to this particular point in time. That when you credit those arguments, it means that in your world, you support a world where these people are consistently marginalized in society. There is the first practice that prevents these people from getting access to access to these particular tools, right? But another thing that they get on their premise is that these countries are very poor and these countries are largely dependent on aid and all of those things. But now we think that that in and of itself is premised on the idea that just a particular few have access to wealth, right? Not that the economy is necessarily in shambles because like wealth is not properly distributed among everybody. So with regards to um, pulling of taxes, we are going to get these things in a very small amount because the amount that people earn on the norm are not amounts that necessarily can, can um, 
and make up for government deficit in all those particular regard. And that is why we are having today's debate, right? So this, today's debate looks like in the event where these countries are in that develop, in the event where a lot of people in these countries are poor, in the event where like tax aggregation is not even is sufficient to actually make up for um, government for government deficit, what do you do? What do you do in that regard? Do you say that we should continuously let a very minute session of the people that get to um, get to hold up to this particular world? And what that means is that these people are the only are the biggest contributors to the economy. Should you shut out all the people from contributing to the economy? And that's why we are having this, this debate. I'm going to be giving you three particular extensions. One, to show you, um, to show you why these people are doing like have the intent to hold up to this world and constantly marginalize it. I'm equally going to show you why this is right for us to do so. And I'm going to um, give a particular clarity on our model. But before that, see you. So do you trust the state to responsibly employ less radical redistributive policies such as a scaled tax? So, panel, this is the reason why like, other alternatives are not going to work. That was the um, first thing I was going to talk about five begin my extension. Panel, we think that the states in you know, you know, right, have a particular role to be able to do some of these things. It looks like when the Prime Minister tells you that Mugabe has tried this many times, you know, the reason why Mugabe failed in that particular regard was his, like his method of distribution and how it equally did not solve that particular problem that we need. And that's why we are going to propose a better model that deals with this particular thing. So on state incentive, you know, to a extent where these states are like built and then they understand the tenets of democracy and they understand that they exist to make sure that wealth is redistributed like on an even scale where everybody gets to participate there and um, participate in these particular economies and make sure that the tax aggregation is very much um, is very much high so that we are not able to or we're able to cut our dependencies on foreign aid and that is why the state has one an incentive and two particularly good role to make sure that they carry these things out but secondly you know the state have been trying to engage in this particular like less radical form of going to engage them trying to get them to pay taxes and all of those things right but they, all of these things have failed and that's why we are having today's debate they don't show us why those things particularly would work but from our side of the house, to the extent where these things have necessarily failed that we don't think that we can trust like these things like you know yourself again it looks like these particular people right trying to use the kind of um coercive powers that they have to be able to like coerce the state and bully the state in and of itself like to make sure that some of these like things like taxation and all of those things that's no work if they are going to run taxation and all other sorts of um, other sorts and forms of redistribution as an alternative, then they need to give us extra uh, multiple layers of analysis to show why, in as much as like it has no work for us, that's why mm -hmm. I mean, it would work for us in the um, in, in moving forward if they don't show you that it's that they cannot rank above, above us, right? But first off, to my extension, right? And I would think that there is actually an intent from this um white minority to be able to keep on to this particular world this white right majority to be able to keep on like this world, right? I know I've not already established how these things were like unjustly acquired and all of those things, but even to the extent where their willingness to um, keep to hold, to hold on these particular things and then maintain the structural biases, which particularly all argues to you that, well, we are, let us, we, they assume that blacks are not capable of taking particular ownership and making sure that these businesses are successful and all of it looks like capitalism and intrinsic capitalism, in that particular case, where they exploit these blacks and make sure that they do not come anywhere near like um, a, a cream particular or to challenge the authority that they have, right? It looks like, give, like it looks like coercing government to make laws and all those things. And that is why the government must take this particular action in the state. Please. I've already shown you why there is that particular intent and good role for this government to be able to redistribute what properly so that everybody can get to participate in their economy. Right. But secondly, what this particular means and why you should credit this particular argument is that first, this debate is a moral debate in as much as it is like an economic debate, right? As to when, at what point in time, must the government take this particular um, radical action? From our side of the house, we argue that, well, this action on of itself like was unjustly acquired and was unjustly taken from these people because of the same sentiment that you get from OO, and that is why they cannot win today's debate, right? That blacks are incapable of handling their own affairs. They are going to they are going to use it for bad things, and also because like there's a, a lot like a lot of links, uh, there's a lot of channels through which these whites can manage these things. Well, that is how come these things are, are taken away from them. I know to the instance where these things are causing large marginalization, these things are preventing us necessarily from growing as an economy. It's then that we must take that we must, as a moral as a moral principle, be able to redistribute this world, particularly in a way that ensures that everybody 
that ensures that the minority who have been ill treated like are fed off in today's news panel notice the particular position of the government notice the particular position of government in like in instances where like in instances where like people and and, and those in exploitation right now the government is that one body that is supposed to make sure that people who have been badly treated people have been exploited and all of those things have um have like have um the kind of um justice that they want and we give this justice back to them Panel, what I've been showing you so far is to tell you about how even the people, particular people they didn't even cause the harm in the past, don't have the intent and willingness to perpetrate this crime. And that is why we are attacking them in today's instance. The impact in our world looks like this. One, there is proper redistribution of these world. Two, it means that it means that everybody at the end of the day gets a particular share of that particular cake. They're able to effectively maximize profit in that particular regard, and then we're able to develop more as a country. We do not we reject all those premises which say that well, blacks cannot manage their affairs, blacks have no links to external um, factors, and that particular regard, they are going to unjustly um, mistreat them. I thank the previous speaker for the very, very fine speech and would like to invite the deputy leader of the opposition to close the first half of this debate. Here, here. Diallo, are you with us? Yes, sorry. Technical problems. Um, okay, I'm going to start in three, two, one. Look, we're not in contention about the, the fact that we want compensation for the people of Southern Africa, which were plundered by Western countries, right? This is something that we agree about, we are not saying in any way that uh, the local people are not capable of managing these companies. Look at your notes. This is not relied to what my partner said. What we are saying is that even though we want compensation, this is a very, very bad way of achieving that compensation because at best it gives you gains in the short term, which are not going to sustain in the long term. But even those gains are really minuscule. This means that even if you want to compensate, this is a really bad one. Moreover, my partner already analyzed you alternatives of how do we give better compensation with much, with much less political capital than what they propose. This means that we give you something that we have a lot of yet to do, right? We analyzed you what you are able to do Antitrust, uh, antitrust regulations, while you are able to do more taxation, which is much more progressive. This means that in a lot of situations, you take more from those who, uh, from the companies that earn more and not just expropriate all the companies altogether and note the huge burden on government side, right? Why is this uh, the, the case? This is more likely, uh, th this is less uh, uh, of a political capital because it's more likely to pass through parliament, which is also affected by these governments. In Southern Africa, you, in South Africa, you also have a, a large uh, a white minority of the population. This means they have sway in parliament. Secondly, it's much more likely to withstand uh, diplomatic international pressure from other uh, countries and stuff like that. Thirdly, it's less likely to be affected by a uh, protest. Note, if you take away all the money from people, it's likely that they will resist this very, very hard. If you take some of it, then they have to now weigh whether it's more beneficial for them to stay a job and earn a lot of money and protest. We just believe that in a lot of situations, you can do a sensible thing. This basically takes down all the compensation that opening government want because we show you that we get it better under our side. I'm going to now have three points. First of all, um, responding to the principle. Secondly, why does the economy get so much worse? And lastly, who is going to uh, replace all these people, uh, uh, all the companies? Here's the thing, opening governments tell us basically, look, there's a massive uh, uh, wealth inequality and therefore people have less access to societal changes. Here's the thing, they don't allow us to ask them a POI. My partner already states this. They don't in any way explain to us what the mechanism is and how this redistribution is actually going to happen. Given that this is the case, we honestly don't understand how people are going to get the money, right? How, what, what happens physically to a company? You take down their shares and divide them to people. This assumes that the shares stay in the same in the same value, which is something that Gil already analyzed to you. This is not going to be the case. 
Moreover, they don't answer in any way the, the uh, claim coming from my partner explaining to you why countries are dependent, uh, why these countries are dependent on external investments, right? What they do want is to give people at best a once in a lifetime lump sum of money that doesn't give them job in the long term, doesn't give them training and education for, uh, uh, for better jobs, doesn't give them welfare, right? Because this is something that people will either use up or bad alternatives that are going to happen. What's the point of this? That even if you give them some compensation, it's going to be so bad that we honestly think it's not compensating enough. A comparative here is where we get a better economy. And once we have redistribution of wealth through taxation, we just give people something that is more sustainable, right? Why is the economy going to get so much worse? Um, so here's the thing, this is enough for, for us to win this. First of all, because if you don't if you don't earn money from companies, then you are not going to get uh, 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 money in any way. This means that you're not going to get compensation. This means that we beat OG on their own method. Um, uh, and before I go on, OG. Yes. What political incentives exist for these antitrust laws and taxation regimes to be implemented? First of all, you have a huge fiat of defending what you are proposing. So we just think that it's a lesser fiat than what governments have in this debate. But secondly, we just believe that in South Africa, there was a revolution in which the ANC is now controlling the, uh, the, the parliament. And they have every incentive to cater to their voters, which are the mass the vast majority inside these countries. This is the same across all Southern Africa. Uh, CG, do you have a question? Okay, moving on. So why specifically are a lot of these uh, uh, investments not going to happen or why are these companies going to collapse? Here's the thing. Once you take these companies from the people managing them and give them away, this is the instance where you lose all the ties and connections that these countries, companies have under status quo, right? Note, this means that you don't have connections to your suppliers. You don't have connections to the people you export to. You don't have connections to be able to actually sell your products. This just means that these companies lose a lot of value to begin with once you just take them away from the people uh, 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 managing them. Note also, a lot of situations, companies don't have one factory in one country. They have 10 factories in 10 different countries, which creates somewhat of an assembly line. If you expropriate only one part of these factories, this just creates a situation where these companies don't have access to the rest of the assembly pieces. This just means that they lose value instantly. And these comp multinational companies can just replace this factory with a factory in another place like Brazil or China. This is enough for us to basically win the debate. Um, uh, and lastly, we're not claiming that it's hard for them to, to for hard for local people to manage these companies, right? What we're claiming is that specifically taking away companies which are managed by foreigners currently is going to reduce their value by a lot compared to a situation where you grow these companies as local companies to begin with. Because of antitrust laws, because of redistribution, you can just have a lot of comp local companies be created to begin with. This just creates a situation where these local people can manage all of these companies. This is the biggest impact in this debate. This creates organically the comparative advantage that we want. Lastly, where are these companies going to go? We think that there are two likely alternatives. Either the government is going to manage them and the government is really bad in managing these companies because their income is now uh, uh, attached to this company, which is a, a conflict of interest because they can dry out other companies in the market. They don't have any incentive to do antitrust laws. And because this is a, a way to create lobbyism and put people in positions of power. Another alternative, which we think is also worse, is local tycoons taking part of these companies. We think that this is just does, doesn't prove redistribution like opening government wants. Daniel, previous speaker for a very fine speech. I would like to invite the member of government to open the second half of this debate. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. Please just give me a second to fix up my papers. Okay. Um, please pardon me if I look on my uh, page a lot, on my books a lot, it's because the lighting in the room is a bit bad, and so it's a bit difficult. 
can also see. And let's just shut down my notifications. Oops. Okay, um, could I ask that for POIs, that um, speakers unmute themselves and say POI? It's a bit difficult to focus on um, the chat space as well. And let me actually try using a torch. Okay, starting in three, two, one. Panel, there's very important context that we ought to understand in this debate. The conversation on expropriation in Southern Africa is a conversation that has been happening. This conversation, however, was specifically tied to the expropriation of land without compensation. So the nuance of this debate is expropriating foreign and white owned businesses specifically. What we're proving and the context that we're operating under is that owners of these businesses have become a significant structural impediment to the conversation on expropriating land, especially without compensation. And so it is specifically important that we expropriate businesses, especially in the achievement of the greater aim of expropriating land. That's an important piece of context. Secondly, just with regards to my speech itself, I'm going to uh, integrate my uh, rebuttal responses into my positive matter, but I will flag it when I get there. So the first point that I'm going to address, the first piece of extension is honestly a very nuanced principle justification in this debate that takes into consideration this nuanced piece of context that we have provided. The principle justification in this debate panel is that this provides a challenge this meaning the expropriation of these businesses provides a challenge to the stagnance in the conversation about expropriation of land. This is because white business owners and foreign business owners have often claimed that the utility of this land, i.e. for their businesses and for, uh, uh, for their businesses and like mining and all of that is, for, um, is far greater than the responsibility to redress the historical ills. Why is this a sufficient reason for us to expropriate, right? Or rather, why is this not a sufficient reason for us not to expropriate? We say that it's simply important because expropriation must take place. There is already a political consensus that is a majority that is in support of this conversation. Therefore, white business owners aren't necessarily an actor that has the capacity to influence this because the people who are in need of expropriation, the people who require the benefit of all of this land are the people who honestly are the most important actor, right? The people who were plundered in the first place. But secondly, we would say that expropriation simply must take place for that reason. Therefore, where the claim on the secondary use of the land, i.e. for business ventures, becomes an impediment, it's important for the state to prioritize the principal mandate, which is the one that is supported by the broader political consensus of the public. What is therefore the impact of supporting this principle? We'd say that firstly, we take businesses to therefore take land. But th what this specifically means is that although we are not likely to uh, get like an immediate distribution of the wealth that comes from all that is expropriated, it means that we remove the impediment to that very conversation, which is good because it means that the different conversations and processes of policy implementation are no longer stagnant because of this particular actor that is clinging onto the secondary use of the land that we seek to expropriate. Why is this good? Firstly, we say that post-colonial governments, not now, we say that post-colonial governments have, ex have explicitly, have or rather have an explicit mandate to undo the present harms that exist as a consequence of the concessions of land and industries like mining that their predecessors made, right? Especially because they all often concede to the mandate to redress the ills of colonial structures. Secondly, we say that this challenges the legacy of colonial structures and incentive. The legacy was to exclude indigenous groups from the wealth of the state and dispossess them of all that they own. Literally taking back that was 
planned it, is a direct challenge to a legacy that said you deserved none of what you owned before. The third reason, and this is in direct response to the point that we get from OO, is why is this then important to prioritize over these strong connections with the global economy like OO tells us? We'd say that this is because foreign and even white businesses often threaten leaving often, which means that there's already an instability in their existence in these states because of how often they hold the government ransom. However, we said that this instability that they threaten is often due to a lot of civil conflict, right? And so we'd say that, however, and especially because this is a popular contestation, this being, again, this conversation on land expropriation, it means that instability that threatens the exit of uh, foreign and white businesses is one that is prevailing because this conversation has consistently been happening. That's why companies like General Motors have even left South Africa because the political instability is apparently considered to be way too much for their profitability. Therefore, we say that they are an already volatile investment in the state ought not to base its decisions on an already volatile actor. But we say that also often, they often hold the government ransom when it attempts to make progressive and pro-people choices. For example, Anglo Gold Ashanti, what's this, holding the government ransom to not make it part of the conversation on investigating why the police uh, were killing the, uh, the miners who are protesting under terrible working conditions, even if it's crazy because they were literally the reason why the miners were protesting. But before I proceed, I'll take this point of information. Even if this succeeds in expropriating land, CG needs to explain why expropriating land is outweighs all of the harms and poverty created by expropriating the companies and why this I've is I've just explained this. They're government. already a volatile actor. And so I'm going to, and they're, uh, they're also against pro-people policy that benefits people specifically. So we don't kind of need people who are an impediment to the well-being of people. But I'm moving on to, again, a lot of information, a lot of analysis on practicality. So again, we then conclude that they aren't an actor that the state ought to prioritize principally. Let's then move on to practicality. What is the unique value of businesses, of expropriating businesses? Firstly, businesses are gatekeepers to progressive policies, right? And this is because they hold disproportionate power in comparison to citizens who are major who in the majority of instances are the like are, are poor, right? And this is because money often translates into political capital. And therefore, if you don't have money to influence the state, which is typically the citizen situation, it means that you're at a disadvantage. Secondly, we say that foreign companies are especially important to remove because they're an impediment to accountability and policies that are people centered. I gave an example of the Marigana protests and them refusing investigation, even if there were the reason why the protesters were protesting in the first place, were protesting in the first place, right? Lastly, we'd also then say, even the good that is, would say that with white businesses specifically, rather, there's an important symbolism of their continued, there's a bad symbolism, continued symbolism of their continued existence, which is to say, they essentially exist to continue the colonial legacy symbolically of dispossession. But even the good, the corporate social responsibility and investment that these businesses perform to pacify the public that wants to take ownership of what they have is often insignificant in comparison to the wealth and value of those businesses itself. Basically, it's better for Black people to own the private mining companies as opposed to like buying gold at very expensive rates from these companies in the long run. For all of these reasons, very, very proud to propose. I thank the previous speaker for the very fine speech. We'd like to invite the member of opposition to continue the case for opposition. Here, here. I, am I audible? Yes. Great. I'll take POIs through chat. Uh, uh, content warning. I'll be speaking about violence in this speech. Okay. Starting my speech in three, two, one. Two novel extensions in closing opposition. Firstly, we're going to explain why this plunges the country into crisis and why things get substantially worse from the status quo, even if we do nothing. And secondly, why it is the case that you cannot trust the state to expropriate the land, even if in the abstract expropriating the businesses and land would be a good idea. Before that, though, some direct response to closing government, since I do think they have a really smart frame. Uh, let's deconstruct it. The first is their frame assumes land expropriation is inevitable. They've just kind of assumed political consensus exists without giving any structural reasons for why this is true. There are a variety of reasons as for why this might not be true. One, the government might feel a government reprisal. Two, the government might might be in a politically insecure situation due to COVID, which means that they cannot expect to do this for the next three to four years, which at that point, like your political future will be very, very uncertain. Thirdly, many of these people are like bought off by like landowners in the country already. So realistically speaking, even if they wanted to, like they would not do that. But fourthly, there's also a very bad history of land reform existing in many of these countries. Like Mugabe, when he attempted to do it, like gave most of the farms to himself and his cabinet members and only gave like two to the people that he actually met, was supposed to give it to. So realistically speaking, there are a lot of reasons for why land expropriation is not
not inevitable. But even if we assume it is inevitable, they actually make it worse. Like they just assume um, not having expropriated businesses is an impediment to this without recognizing the fact that the process of going through expropriating these businesses is in itself an impediment to imp implementing land expropriation, assuming that is a good thing. Like there are three reasons for why this makes any policy of, of other form, uh, any other policy of expropriation substantially more difficult. One, you substantially learn from the process for it. Like not, now not only do you have to divvy up all the land in the country, you also have to divvy up all the businesses and assets and stocks and you have to decide where, the th where these things go. Like realistically speaking, how is these th how are these things going to be divided? Like do they sell off the stocks? Like do they have fire sales or do they like distribute it to people in the community? If it is the case that they sell it, this means that like businesses get still get distributed to people like disproportionately at the top. So realistically speaking, they're not solving anything. They haven't given us a clear and transparent mechanism for how things get solved. Secondly, they also massively reduce public support for it for all the reasons we mentioned earlier. But thirdly, you also get way less private support for any further expropriation. Like all the cabinet members that have political allies that like fund them or like business or like get like favors from foreign businesses now will turn against both the Land Expropriation Act and the Business Expropriation Act as these things have bundled together. So realistically speaking, they don't solve any of their problems and the frame doesn't actually like provide any meaningful solvency to the debate. But let's say you don't believe that. Here are two arguments to outweigh everything else that's been said in the round, even if you don't believe any of the response I've given. First, this plunges the country into crisis in two ways. First, it causes violence. Why? For many people, this is their livelihood. You're taking away something that they feel is theirs and will defend to the death, and you're not even giving them compensation. Like their futures are destroyed and they will no longer be able to apply for loans because they can't like do things for themselves in the future. You're taking away their homes, but you're also taking away their livelihood. This literally happened like after the Lancaster Agreement in Zimbabwe, where people took up arms and violently took back their possessions and took over the farms that the country took from them. Like there are so many guns left over from the Rhodesian Bush Wars, like the Namibian question in 1990. So if it is the case that they've built up resources over the years, they will have the money to buy private militias. They will have the money to fight back against the state and violently rebel, given that you're, given that you're taking these things from them without any compensation. Like realistically speaking, the alternative for them is either leave the country or to fight to the death. But also it's entirely possible that you also anger geopolitical giants with an incentive and an interest in your local industries. Like the last time a country tried to do this on like for a major industry that foreign companies had an investment in, um, it was Iran, by the way, or Iraq, they got invaded. So like realistically speaking, this is not a safe or stable solution for your country, especially in a time of exceeding exigency. Secondly, you're also likely to invoke economic collapse in four separate mechanisms from OO, since I think CG responded to the ones from OO. Firstly, the process of restructuring and refactoring and dividing businesses during which no, is a time during which no one is being productive and the country starves. Secondly, the movement of labor, people leaving the country as they fear a repeat of riots, a loss of jobs and their job security being totally upended, you hamstring the labor market in many of these countries. Thirdly, bank runs. Individuals who fear the economic shockwave to withdraw from their deposits uh, from banks, which we expect to freeze loans and the financial market in general. Fourthly, the collapse of market confidence, since that now there's no guarantee that new business owners and new business leaderships will be any free from the corruption that marred like previous expropriation attempts, as well as just there's no guarantee they'd even be any good at this business. So um, here's the weighing then as for why this wins debate. Firstly, in principle, it might be good. It's not worth starving over. Perhaps you have a responsibility to give back something you stole, but if the consequence of doing that means that you get shot, that con a consequentialist framework takes precedence of, uh, over the reason that survival is like, and the ability to put food on the table without the looming shadow of violence is a prerequisite to the fuzzy feelings of reparation. This also outweighs against the prospective policy changes in CG. Secondly, their policy creates new oppression since it's entirely plausible that a minority class you described as elite would seek to seize the reins of control since a fragile compromise bartered all those years ago never worked, that no longer works. This is a very, very real potential in that, at, like, the expropriation might go fine for the first few years, then a new government is elected and land is redistributed back into the hands of white people using the same overriding powers you grant to the government. So this worsens inequality and overturns every principal outcome that they give. I'll take a POI from OG now. So this debate is about a matter of rights. Even if they fail, the outcomes are still justified because they are entitled to this property. I'll take a POI from CG. So to be clear, your worst possible outcome is that in a new election, the land goes back to white people and foreign powers. No, our worst outcome is violence, but also we're not like you can't just say that the principle is more important than the outcome. We've given explicit weighing as for why the outcome like precludes the principal conclusion. So beyond that, comparison to OO for this first argument, they point out the economy is suboptimal now in OO. We outweigh this about on the consideration of gravity. People face violence and direct threats on their ability to survive and persist into the future. Secondly, our arguments don't rely on fixing the hypothetical present with the co corporations being benevolent. In fact, it assumes that even if corporations are malevolent, this substantially worsens the effects of that malevolence. Thirdly, our arguments explain that things get worse from an already oppressive status quo. We don't rely on any other policy to, to make things worse. But fourthly, our governments, our arguments clash 
head on sharply with the Gulf principle. OO assumes that the outcomes are more important without justifying the underpinning consequentialist framework versus the principal material in Gulf. We do, and that's why we take precedence over opening up. This first argument won this debate. Second argument, why is it the case that we can't trust the state? Corruption. So do you really trust the state to do these things? Like even if it is the case that in the abstract, it would be a good idea. If as everyone else in the round has established, the state has had a bad track record of doing this in the past and has been distributing this these stuff to their cronies. Like when this happened in Zimbabwe, when this happened in like Namibia and under Jacob Zuma, right? Like this is structurally likely for three reasons. One, that you they're capable of employing an incendiary us versus them narrative to cast off suspicion from their own actions, which means that it's hard, it's easier for them to like hide the actual corrupt things that they're doing when it comes to their businesses. Secondly, they can use this as a tool to target political enemies by immediately reducing their power. The government doesn't even have to compensate them. And now political parties can punish people for not following their directives and not falling in line. Thirdly, they can also secure political safety by rewarding allies with sweetheart deals and like predator and like I guess like preferential contracts with these people. So on weighing, why does this win the round? Firstly, this material is prior. All their conclusions rely on distributing land fairly to adequately resolve poverty. If they don't do this, none of their materials meet any of the solvency that they demand in order to claim any benefits. Like, yes, it might be a good idea and hypothetical to give all of our guns to the hypothetical over God so that we wouldn't shoot each other. But if that over God also threatens to shoot all of us, then this doesn't make things any better. But secondly, our material explains a direct principle to harm. They extend the imperialism they fight back against on government since it allows for further plunder and theft. This outweighs the principle of attempting to reparate theft since the reparative principle is contingent on believing that the harm itself is grave enough that we should seek to prevent it. Beyond that, the reparative principle doesn't actually undo harm caused, so it's insufficient to outweigh in this debate. At the end of the speech, we do two things. The first is we win, and the second is we win even harder. For these reasons, negate. I thank the previous speaker for the very fine speech, and I would like to invite the government whip to close the case for government as we hold. Yeah. Uh, hi, I just want to check that I'm audible. Yep. Okay, cool. Uh, just a POI, I would prefer my POIs if they were given to me the text, uh, or you can also like flag me through the video um, if by like five I don't take any. Uh, cool. Okay. Just getting with my papers, I'll start as possible. Okay, starting in three, two, one. Very important to understand is the worst case scenario in the closing opposition is two things. Firstly, it's that an election happens and the land goes back to white people in which they concede is a bad thing, which means that they concede that there needs to be some kind of change that happens. But secondly, their worst case scenario is violence, which at best is very poorly mechanized because it's very unlikely that a privileged class of people that have still got pretty relatively good livelihoods, even if they were to give up their businesses right now, would just take up arms and start a revolution and live the rest of their life trying to fight the government. That's a pretty unlikely scenario. But even if that was the comparative, that's not true, right? For a couple of reasons. Number one, because the context of Southern Africa means that there needs to be a change that happens because the kind of instability, the kind of racial tension, the kind of violence that is taking place already exists. The kind of instability in the economy, the kind of people removing things from their bank accounts, people constantly pulling in and pulling out a very unstable source of foreign direct investment already exists in the Southern African context. This is why every year there is a protest that happens called Fees Must Fall that halts all higher education for close to months. This is why every year there are protests that happen in mines like Marikana against Anglo-American that halts production. And that means that the RAND falls. This is why every single year there are multiple protests that happen for the expropriation of land in which land is already forcibly acquired by lobbyists and activist movements. The kind of violence you fear is the kind of violence that already exists. That's why there is no comparative harm that exists on your side and you don't win. The only argument I really get from the closing opposition, if I'm honest, is, hey, this might be like Zimbabwe. A couple of reasons why it's not. Number one, they ask us to provide proof that there is some kind of political incentive for land redistribution to happen. In 2019, the Constitution of South Africa was reformed to allow property rights to not be given auspices and to allow constitutional reform to happen for the expropriation of land. This means there is a constitutional process that is following that, that 
land expropriation actually happens compared to, to the Zimbabwe incident in which Mugabe just expropriated land against the recommendations and actually against the ruling of the Southern African Tribunal Court. This is one that's actually constitutionally backed compared to Zimbabwe, which is still relatively new and under like an autocracy. Southern Africa is largely ruled by, dem by, by very strong constitutions that have the capacity to be held accountable. Powerful lawyers, powerful activists, Anyone who is capable of putting in things like tax reforms is also, also capable of monitoring things like land expropriation, right? But lastly, this isn't even really that contentious in, the, in today's debate, right? Because if you're going to talk about justice and if you're going to talk about what the South African people want, it is land expropriation, something that has already been decided. The conversation then becomes what is the best means for us to achieve some kind of legitimacy for Southern Africa, that's where the debate lies. This then brings me onto two main questions. Firstly, what are the economic outcomes of this? But secondly, why is our policy likely to succeed? Uh, before that, I'll take a POI from the opening. Yeah, sure, change needs to happen. We show multiple easier alternatives to bring back more money and power to black hands, which increases political power to expropriate land without crashing the entire economy, which will likely prevent expropriating Perfect. land. Perfect. Okay, this actually brings me on to my first point really nicely, which is why your alternatives don't work. And it's for the same reasons that you believe land expropriation won't work, however it's grossly misplaced. Because the alternatives are things like tax reform, or the alternatives are things like businesses. Uh, yeah, like essentially you just bring about tax reforms or you bring about like businesses putting in place antitrust laws. Number one, even the United States government can't actively put an antitrust laws against people who are actively committing antitrust. Even the United States government can't really put in place gun laws because the NRA opposes this is a very well capacitated government. On the comparative, governments in Southern Africa don't have the capacity to actually put in place this kind of legislation because as Linda points out, they're constantly held under ransom by these businesses who constantly threaten to pull out, right? This is why there's a gross power asymmetry, even more comparable than like the likes of the United, the United States. But secondly, it's because the governments are corrupt, right? As closing government points, as closing opposition points out rather, these governments are really corrupt. They're in collusion with these businesses. The comparative then becomes that you take these businesses, you take the infrastructure that these businesses have, and you put them directly under the private ownership and under the ownership of people. You don't have to rely on the government to actually put in place all this stuff. You don't have to rely on the government to put in place tax breaks. There's an argument that comes out of closing opposition that I find really interesting that says, why would we trust the government to put in place land expropriation? Number one, land expropriation is something that we can actually audit, right? There's already constitutional amendments and already constitutional reform to carry out that process. There is accountability. What we cannot do is perpetually allow the government to continue to just rely on them to try to reform these businesses because they've been proven to not do this. What we have to do is allow the transfer of those businesses into South African hands, into black owned hands, so that it's likely that that situation will change. We don't have to perpetually around the government to bring in place things like tax breaks, which haven't come, and there's no proof that they likely will come, right? So that's then on that. But secondly, then, we think that the reason why businesses are particularly important is because beyond things like just stocks, businesses have got actual like physical uh, like infrastructure, right? So there's this argument that comes out that says, well, why would well, the problem is that these businesses, when they become transferred, lose the ability to have things like contacts and they lose their competitive advantage. A couple of responses to this, they don't, because as you correctly point out, they have natural resources, which are always high in demand. But secondly, they do have a lot of skilled labor, right? I'll take a POI from the closing if they have any. So I just want to point out your point on auditing also probably works for like all of the policies of opening opposition. Like this isn't really an exclusive, Nick. At no, worst, that's not like... true. That's not true, because what we propose is a change in ownership of a business, as opposed to allowing the government to just window dress and say, yeah, we're working with businesses, because essentially that doesn't mean anything. When the government has to prove that they've shifted the ownership of businesses, that's where we get the change. So then onto what I was talking about, which is essentially why, why businesses are important, right? And businesses, or, or rather why it's likely that our policy works. Number one, there is tons of skilled labor. Contrary to popular belief, there is a lot of skilled labor that already exists in the Southern African context, right? And this is because there are already high education institutions. There's like, like for example, universities like University of Witwatersrand or Stellenbosch or UP would not be producing really great research work if there wasn't skilled expertise that had the ability to run these businesses 
effectively, right? On the comparative, we think that the reason that they can't coexist or that we can't get any progression in the status quo is because the existing businesses are actually putting in place really oppressive laws that stifle internal competition, but secondly, that hold them unable to be accountable to workers on the ground, right? Classic examples of this are all the things that Linda already told you about Marikana or about all the ways in which businesses have an asymmetry and therefore unaccountable to people very proud to uh, propose. I thank the previous speaker for the verifying speech. We'd like to invite the closing opposition whip to close the debate as a whole. Be here. Um, hello, this is my microphone. Can I be heard? Yes. All right, thank you. Um, POIs in the chat. I'll watch the chat for all of your POIs. Okay. Um, starting my speech in three, two, one, and go. Three issues in this speech. Number one, the principle of OG. Number two, closing government's nationalization. And number three, OO's mechanisms. Number one, on the principle of OG. So opening government's principle is actually not genuinely fair and just. And if we can prove that it is not applicable in the context of expropriation, then we beat them. Two responses. Number one, this principle is not universalizable to all foreign and white-owned businesses, even more so for the vast majority of them. Two demonstrations. Number one, foreign investment from China China, which makes up 18.3% of imports in South Africa and wherein China owns majority of the mining companies in platinum, gold, and uranium. Obviously, this country did not participate in the plunder and the historical apartheid in these countries, and therefore, they are not the individuals that you should target. Number two, many white-owned businesses are not directly culpable, which is to say that, or at least significantly, are less culpable today than they would have been in a previous generation, because most of these are obviously not the same individuals that are targeted. For example, in South Africa, these are many mixed races that are also owning these businesses and also many of these ex many of these white minorities in these countries also experience structural disenfranchisement in many different cases like in Botswana with the Kagandi people I think at least if this is a mitigation to the principle I think it significantly shows that the principle does not apply and therefore cannot always be universalizable and be fair in the vast, vast majority of cases so you have to rely on the second response we provide to you which is this in the vast majority of cases then expropriation does not only harm the owners alone because you're pursuing that you're redistributing from the owners to the rest of these individuals and the ownership is therefore good in of itself, but what expropriation does is it has two specific impacts that we talked about that opening opposition missed. Number one, you are likely going to lead to the replacement of these owners from the white and foreign businesses into other dominant ethnic groups who are the likely recipients of these projects, even if they're not the, you know, even if they are, they might presumably be descendants of many of these in individuals and therefore it might be just to a certain degree, but it causes significant inequalities in the status quo. Like for example, with the Ovambo people in, 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 uh, uh, in Namibia, for example, because many of the governments are one one party rule, the neocolonialism and authoritarianism of these own governments do lead to significant disenfranchisement to other um, white minorities and other different ethnic groups within the country because of the uh, structural power power uh, power vacuum that they're able to exploit because of these reasons. But the second reason is um, workers get significantly disrupted in the process of expropriation simply because of the, the the reasons that David brought to you that in the short run when the like the, these businesses change ownership from one another, it does do significant harm in their capacity to find a newer job or to be able to transfer under another business or transfer under different management and ownership. For these reasons, I think the principle does not apply. It therefore fails in the vast majority of cases and it does more harm than good. Number two, closing government and expropriation and nationalization. So I want to point out that the response to the previous speaker is actually not a real response in terms of, um, you can't type down stuff in the pew, in the chat, like, that's just unfair. Um, the response against us in saying that we are have a corrupt government and it's likely going to lead to more harms is uncharitable. They say that there's an auditing process. Two reasons that this is untrue and it is unlikely. Number one, an auditing process only shows a shift in ownership, but it doesn't change in the management on how these businesses will operate and where the money and the profits of these will go to these business owners or whether it's going to entrench inequalities in the ground. But number two, the like it either has to be you leave discretionary part of the government or you lead it to a bidding process. If it is a bidding process, then it is likely going to go to the hands of the rich within those ethnic groups and also going to lead to disproportionate harms, especially when, the, when within the country, the internal inequality within these nations gets uh, exacerbated at the most. So that's where the risk of 
conflict and violence within the country also increases, particularly when these workers are, you know, are going to be discredited because of the fact that their owners are against them. Government's response to our extension is that many of these foreign businesses and these Owners, for example, are, are very volatile. They hold these countries hostage, and they're also getting better and better over time. But to a certain degree, they also concede that many of these different governments are also corrupt. So to the degree that you believe there's political will, but there's also corruption, I think you have to be reasonable and look at the middle ground and assess whether or not the foreign businesses are therefore fair. We have three reasons as to why this is untrue. Number one, this is uncomparative. We demonstrated that expropriation can also lead to the government holding its own country and its own people hostage, such as how Mugabe's takeover of the water utilities in Zimbabwe also led to entrenchment and control for the military, or even not just for Mugabe, but also the aftermath of the corruption in South Africa and the ANC. Like The simple fact of the matter is, control ownership and the ability for you to overtrust and over rely on government does more harm than good compared to the vast majority of cases where you rely on foreign ownership number two it's better with foreign owners because of competition with other foreign actors versus relying on one singular government to be able to make these decisions but number three even if we are going to agree that this debate is about black owned businesses versus china controlling all businesses then our response is very simple china can exact its influence in many other ways in the status quo in its world like undermining african trade under the sadc or for example example, there can be a high propensity for interstate or inter-ethnic um, conflict within the status quo. Like, for example, the private the private militarization within these countries, or for example, China um, uh, continuously threatening to pull out of the region as well. So um, to the degree that this is symmetric, I think it's exacerbated and made worse on their model. CG. So with regards to the black elite, we think it's more likely that this is going that it's going to be the case that they own a lot of the property. But what's good about this is that the property is owned by people who have a social political obligation to other people, the same way tax systems work, especially because they don't want to be a sellout. So if you're in a better capacitated place, you know that you want to transfer that wealth, especially because they also benefit from a capacitated population who can seconds. buy and use the services 15 of the businesses. Order. That now own. 15 seconds. All right, OG, let's go. OG? Yeah, OG. Hello. So from my speech, I, I asked you how Mugabe is distributed along the lines of ethnicity field, and we proposed one where it is fair. But secondly, we showed you how, even though like China even has this hold of the corporations, to the extent where they are able to hold on to the laws that ensure this marginalization, we must equally hold China complicit and take it from China too. Yeah, so the response against CG is that in the vast majority of cases, if these are already black owned businesses that already entrench power, then you also agree that the parliamentary and the decision making process in these governments is also likely to be unfair and going to disproportionately fire them as well. And therefore, our conclusion stands. The response against OG is that if you're saying that foreign companies and foreign businesses like China are also have to be you know, get, deserve recompense against many of these groups, I think our response is very simple: is that the vast majority of cases, again, is that if the country relies on trade with these nations, anyways then it is likely to do more long-term harm and especially to the economy and to different laborers and workers as well. So I think just to conclude, opening opposition's mechanisms rely on capital flight, the loss of expertise and innovation and the loss of international trade. But what David talks to you about is the expropriation process specifically as to why the government does more harm than good, why it's more guaranteed, and why the escalating tensions and conflict within these regions does increase over time. For these reasons, you have to oppose.